Ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, please start to take your seats. We're going to start real soon here. Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you enjoyed your lunch. How about that location for a military dining facility? You know? Nice view of the water in Merritt Island. Sometimes you see dolphins, you know? It's rough, you know. Okay, our first presentation this afternoon will be presented by Ms. Cynthia Dunn. Ms. Dunn is the Sure. Good. Ms. Dunn is the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Director for the Tax Exempt and Government Entities Division Internal Revenue Service. She will now present to you her Promoting Diversity and Inclusion in the Federal Workforce presentation. Ms. Dunn? Thank you. Thank you. I said I have a tough spot this afternoon right after lunch and we were on the water, it was so beautiful. Um, again, hello Diomi. Hello. <laughs> I wanna thank Major Richardson as well as Major Daniel for having me here and for all the uh, things they did to get me here, which was really great. Uh, Mr. Guzman, I wanna thank you as well. And before we get started, before I started my presentation, I'd like to tell you a little bit about me. Next slide, please. You know, federal offices have a really long title or name. <laughs> I am a direct report to the TEGE commissioner, as well as holding the longest, uh, I'm holding the record as the longest serving EEO EDI director in the service, which makes me feel really old. <laughs> I have over 38 years of federal service, which makes me feel really, really old. And I like to say I started at the age of five. <laughs> I've been in an EEO EDI diversity civil rights field since 1992, so I have over 25 years of experience there. And I'm also uh, members of national EEO organizations like the Federally Employed Women, Blacks in Government, the Federal Asian Pacific American Council, the Society of American Indian Government Employees, Deaf in Government, as well as I serve as workshop presenters. And we're gonna be talking about diversity and inclusion. And a lot of people always ask me, well, why are you members of so many organizations? And they say it's clear that you're not uh, Hispanic or you're not Asian. And I say, can you really tell by looking at us nowadays? Right? I was DNA tested uh, a couple years ago and my DNA came back. I'm 13% Asian. And I went to my mom and dad and said, is this something you all need to tell me? <laughs> So we really don't know. Uh, again, last but surely not least, I'm a proud mother of two sons, and I'm even more proud to say I'm a grandma of four. And I've added another bullet since I created this PowerPoint. I am retirement eligible as of last year. <laughs> so that's a good thing. So let's go to the next slide, please. So what is diversity and inclusion? And I want to start by saying I really enjoyed this morning. Even though I had a little small uh, time in the military. Uh, my ex-husband is retired Army, so I was with him for about nine years, but I really got a real good understanding of EO versus EEO, the federal sector versus uh, the military, because it is different. And I had the opportunity to talk to quite a few people while here, and I'm still learning the differences, and it's fa fabulous, I love it. So let's talk about the definition of diversity. It's a collective mix of individual attributes applied in pursuit of organizational objectives. So that means it's beyond race and gender, right? Definition of inclusion, creating a culture that connects each employee to the organization, encourage collaboration, flexibility, fairness, and leverage diversity throughout the organization so that all individuals are enabled to participate and contribute to their full potential. What's the key words in there? We talk about all, right, each. The key words is leaving nobody behind. Everyone is included. How it all fits together, a diverse workforce that is inclusive ensures equal employment opportunity for all. And we talked about that this morning. EEO is woven into the fabric of diversity and inclusion, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. 
So we're talking about valuing diversity. Valuing diversity means creating a workplace that respects people's differences and recognize the unique contributions that individuals can make. Respecting and valuing differences, diversity programs must be inclusive to be successful. The strength of diversity is set in motion when we respect and value differences. Inclusion is a state of being valued, respected, and supported. Do you believe valuing diversity is also about inclusion? Do you think that statement is true or false? Absolutely. You can't value diversity if everyone's not included, and we're going to talk about that later. Let's go to the next one. I know this is a busy slide, but a lot of people have problems sometimes understanding the differences between EEO, affirmative action employment, and diversity and inclusion. So let's talk about EEO. The goal is to protect, uh, prohibit discrimination in employment. The coverage is all protected uh, classes, which are race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, age, reprisal, sexual orientation, uh, excuse me, parental status, and genetic information. And note, EEO is the distinct between the two, diversity and focus, and e equality and equal access. EEO is legally based in compliance with EEO policy and programs. So in a nutshell, EEO is legal through the EEO process, it's illegal. Affirmative employment or action, the goal is to eliminate underrepresentation in the workplace. The coverage is minorities, women, and persons with disabilities. The law requires federal agencies to develop an AEP, which action items that address underrepresentation of minorities, women, and people with disabilities. And no longer, now we know AEP years ago it used to be called the Affirmative Employment Plan. Now we have what's called MD 715, which is inclusive of everyone. And diversity and inclusion, creating a more inclusive workforce. The coverage is everyone, leaving no one out. Diversity and inclusion is a uh, Mandated, it's not mandated by law. An executive order was signed in 2011 mandating all federal agencies to devise a development and inclusion strategy plan which outlines the agencies to promote diversity and inclusion in the federal workplace. So again, you need to know the differences between the three. And we're gonna talk more about diversity and inclusion. I remember some years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity Commission had called me and asked me if I would serve on a panel discussion. And the panel discussion was EEO versus diversity. It was a brown bag luncheon, and I was on the EEO side. And we had a lot of discussion. Mind you, this was 10 years ago, and before the buzzwords of diversity and inclusion was prevalent like it is now. And we argued the two sides. You know, EEO is law can't take away law, diversity and inclusion is not, so we need to be careful that it could possibly go away. Let's go to the next one. Former President Obama signed the executive order 13583 on August 18, 2011, and it stated that all federal agencies shall implement the government-wide diversity and inclusion plan and here's an insert from his executive order. Our nation derives strength from the diversity of its population and from its commitment to equal opportunity for all. We are at our best when we draw on our talents of all parts of our society and our, and our greatest accomplishments are achieved when diverse perspectives are brought to bear to overcome our greatest challenges. Again, that's a part of the executive order 13583. Let's go to the next one. What is an executive order? An executive order is a signed, written, and published directive from the President of the United States that manages operations of the federal government and, exec, uh, and EEO. It is authorized by Article II of the United States Constitution and it requires no approval from Congress. 
Only a sitting U.S. president may overturn an existing uh, executive order. So again, an executive order gives the president the power to create laws and decide how existing laws should be administered. Let's go to the next one. Again, on uh, August 18, 2011, President Obama signed the executive order 13583, establishing a coordinated government-wide initiative to promote diversity and inclusion in the federal workplace. Again, it requires that all federal agencies are required to submit a diversity and inclusion strategy plan to the Office of Personnel Management. An article was released in December of 2016 that stated President Obama presided over the most demographically diverse administration in history where a majority of the top positions were held by minorities and women for the first time. Let's go to the next one. Next one. So the executive order uh, 13583, their mandates are to develop and issue a government-wide diversity and inclusion strategy plan to focus on workplace diversity, workplace inclusion, and agency accountability and leadership to establish a work plan that highlights hiring, promotions, retention, professional development, and training policies and practices. Identify appropriate practices to improve the effectiveness of each agency's efforts to recruit, hire, promote, retain, and train a diverse workforce. And then implement the agency-specific diversity and inclusion strategy plan. Again, the government plan shall highlight comprehensive strategies for agencies to identify and remove barriers to equal employment opportunity that may exist in federal government recruitment, hiring, promotion, and retention. This is in regards to recruitment, hiring, promotion, retention, professional development, and training policies and practices. Let's go to the next one. Here's some advantages of the Executive Order 13583. It set a tone for the private sector to cultivate. We know the private sector, they have their own regulations about d and but they always look at the federal government as maybe like a format to use or to see what they're doing so that they can you know, copy on what we're doing. Set a tone for the private sector to cultivate, provide a safe haven for future and current federal workers, preserves fairness and equal opportunity to everyone, and ensures that every agency is incorporating the same and similar principles. And that, that's the key. They, the executive order was written so that all agencies will have the same fair process as all others. And a prime example I like to use and what I like about executive order um, 13583 is that uh, President Obama had uh, enacted the Pathways Program. How many people have heard about the Pathways Program? It is an internship program for college students. And when President Obama was in office, he said, it's good that we have all these different internship programs. But what happens to the students once they serve the summer internship? They go back. What happens when we start choosing our relatives and family members to be uh, in the office and no one else is having an opportunity? The Pathways program was specifically created for all students to have an opportunity to apply for a job in the federal government. And it's called the Pathways Program because it was a pathway to federal employment. So after that three or six week internship, they're guaranteed permanent, uh, uh, permanent employment after they graduate. The Pathways Program work with the students. If the students are going to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they may come to work on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. They're going to go around their schedule. They're going to work towards a goal and towards a position on staff so when they graduate, they will actually have a job in place. So that, that's one of the uh, good things that came out of the executive order. Let's go to the next one. So I wanted to share with you um, while the Trump uh, transition team has been silent on the executive order 13583, we face a real threat of seeing it uh, in similar exem uh, uh, executive orders repealed. This possibility has given many of our diverse federal 
uh, employees pause about their future in the federal service. Because remember, any sitting president can repeal an executive order. According to the Washington Post policy and analysis at the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, we're told by others in the Trump administration that the use of seven specific words and phrases would be prohibited in the use of the 2016 budget documents. And those words are vulnerable, evidence-based, science-based, fetus, and I highlighted diversity, entitlement, transgender. So by banning these words, does that promote diversity and inclusion? Everybody's still up. I know we're all full from lunch. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yes. Yes. Only with CDC. It was a written directive. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. To ban those words, that they could not use it in their 2016 budget documents when writing up their budget requests for the year. It was the Washington Post dated December 15, 2017. Yeah. But why doesn't but, it say that the, the Trump administration issued to the CDC? Right. Well, I'm, I'm assuming that they did their research, and I can look back and make sure that that was uh, the directive. OK. What will a rescinded executive order 1353 uh, mean for the future. There are several drawbacks if the executive order 13583 is overturned. Federal agencies will no longer have a mandated requirement of the DNI strategy plan. Some private sectors may discontinue diversity and inclusion practices because we're led by executive orders. The number of EEO complaints could increase because the equity barriers the executive order intended to eliminate may unwittingly reoccur. And then a federal workforce that does not embrace diversity and inclusion. Let's go to the next one. So how can we promote diversity and inclusion within our workplace? Number one, lead by example. Know the diversity goals and vision of your organization. Create a working and welcoming environment. Again, leaving no one out. Employee engagement. Uh, one thing that I like about the IRS, um, several years ago, we won uh, number three as the best places to work in the federal government when it comes to diversity because we have all-inclusive uh, opportunities where we have our employees uh, participate. One of the things that I really like that we... Um, we started in the IRS is, as an EDI director, I have a lot of employees to come to me, and they would always bring up issues and suggestions of how we can make the work better. And one of the things that they talked about over and over again was the um, opportunity for details. We do a lot of details in our organization. And they said, you know, the only time we hear about opportunities or detail opportunities is when an email comes out. Let's congratulate so-and-so for their 120-day detail. So I came up with a suggestion. I said, why not develop a detail opportunities database where all details will have to be put into a database where all employees can see it and apply for the, data, uh, for the details. And I had a lot of drawback at first with one of the commissioners. They're like, Cindy, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, suppose the detail is in Florida and the employee lives in North Carolina, we're not gonna pay for them to move. I said, you're absolutely right. But how do you know that employee doesn't have family members or friends that live there that they could possibly stay with? Everyone should have an opportunity to apply for these detailed opportunities. And after three years, we actually implemented what we call the detailed opportunity database. And how do we measure success? We talked about that this morning. We measure by the decreased number of complaints. When it comes to pre-selection, you know, the pre, uh, people are more happier doing our surveys. You know, they always talk about this detailed opportunity database. In my office, we actually monitor the database. 
we're making sure that the same people aren't being selected over and over again, and then they have a two-year criteria. If you were selected, you can't be selected again for the next two years. Let's go to the next one. So how to get involved in diversity and inclusion efforts. It is imperative that we understand the impact that diversity and inclusion has on our culture. Staying informed on new developments and taking the necessary action will help preserve diversity and inclusion efforts. We need to help students and parents cherish and preserve the ethnic and cultural diversity that nourishes and strengthens this community and the nation. And that was Cesar Chavez. Become a diversity champion for change. Best approach is the top down, bottom up strategy. And I know someone was talking about that earlier, but I said you have to have buy-in from the top. You know, it's fine to start from the bottom too, but we want to have that leadership from the top because what happens when we hear our leaders talking diversity and inclusion? Then we fall in place. Keep diversity in mind when forming interview panels. Recruitment from uh, a diverse pool of applicants means a more qualified workforce. I serve on a lot of our uh, interview panels, especially for our senior manager positions. Because we all know human nature, you know, you want someone to look like you or talk like you during interviews. So it's good to see someone that you feel like you could connect with. So it's important that you have a diverse uh, interview panel. Step outside your box. Who's in your circle? I want you to make a list of the top five people in your inner circle. List their name, their age category, their race, their gender, their educational level, their background, and do they mirror you? Look at those top five and see if they mirror you. And if they don't, try to find someone outside of your circle to connect with. When I first did this exercise, human nature, we tend to you know, put people that we know in our same age bracket, our same culture. But it's good to step outside the box and reach out to people outside of that circle. Go to the next one. Diversity versus inclusion. I always get this question over and over again. What's the difference? What's the difference? And I even put together a brochure that's now an IRS catalog number in the Internal Revenue Service. But I like to say diversity is being asked to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance once you're there. The difference, let's say it again, diversity is being asked to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance once you're there. Diversity is the mix. Inclusion is making sure that the mix mixes well. Next one. I know this is a busy PowerPoint presentation, but it's population by race and Hispanic origin the past in 2014 versus the future. What numbers are really sticking out for you on this chart? And remember, Hispanic origin is considered an ethnicity, not a race. So a lot of people are starting to put themselves more and more into the not Hispanic population. Let's go to the next one. I want to share with you some final thoughts. In the news, the Housing and Urban Development HUD Secretary Ben Carson is proposing to change the agency's mission statement. It currently reads, HUD's mission is to create strong, uh, excuse me, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality affordable homes for all. HUD is working to strengthen the housing market to bolster the economy and protect consumers, meet the need for quality, affordable rental homes, utilize housing as a platform for improving quality of life, build inclusive and sustainable communities free from discrimination, and transform the way HUD does business. According to March 7, 2018, the article changed, uh, changes are already happening. And let's go to the next one, please. This is what the policy has now changed to. 
HUD Secretary's Ben Carson proposed mission statement is, HUD's mission is to ensure Americans have access to fair, affordable housing and opportunities to achieve self-sufficiency, therefore strengthening our communities and nation. It's a big difference. The key diversity and inclusion words are removed like inclusive, free from discrimination. So those are the things that we always think about and, and that's what always have me to think about diversity and inclusion. And is it really here to stay? Let's go to the next one. What are your thoughts? Do you believe that diversity and inclusion is here to stay? If the executive order 13583 is overturned by President Trump, then what? How would that affect the workforce, the federal workforce? Do you believe that the organization will still promote diversity and inclusion initiatives? What can you do to encourage leaders that diversity and inclusion is important to any organization? Look at the current workforce, the diversity of the workforce. Do you believe that uh, the organization would still promote diversity and inclusion without the executive order. How many people think that uh, the organization would still promote DNI initiatives without the executive order? Good. The next one. <clears throat> That ends my presentation. I want to thank you for your attention. Any questions, comments? Thank you. Any comments, questions? We have about, what, 15? A question here. So earlier you said, um, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Herbin, Department of the Army, all that stuff. Okay. <laughs> so you said you cannot value diversity if everyone is not included, which I thought was a great statement, and I'll probably plagiarize and use that again. Use it. But my question is, you also said earlier um, in one of your slides about ensuring that um, there's fair um, inclusion in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So, um, from an Army perspective, and probably speaking for the military as a whole, um, pipeline and making sure things are in the pipeline is more of representation in the perception of some in our armed forces. What's your perspective on um, having the right people in the pipeline earlier on mm -hmm. versus trying to force something in the pipeline mid-level, mid-career, because it's very difficult uh, when you're trying to represent in the um, mid-career pipeline. Mm -hmm. So my other piece to that is um, bringing context. If you have representation, and I think um, it was part of what's going to, we'll be talking about a little bit more tomorrow, Mr. Dillard, I think you sent us a read ahead. Representation is not necessarily what we want. We want more of inclusion because representation to some is like counting heads mm -hmm. or counting color or counting mm -hmm. race. So right. can you give a little bit more perspective there? Okay, I'm gonna first talk about the pipeline you were talking about. And you're right, people can't be formed in the pipeline overnight. We have to get them you know, into the process where they can be in the pro pipeline to move up. And uh, I would say, you know, it takes time. It's not gonna be something that you do overnight. And I know one of the things you said about uh, equity, and I wanted to make mention, we used to say everybody wanna be treated equally. And that's not the case now. People wanna be treated fairly because what Rock may want may not be what I want. Does that make him wrong or me wrong or right? No, it's what he wants. So we have to make sure that we're talking about treating people fairly versus equitably. So um, the next thing you talked about is um, representation, I think you said. What was the second part of your question? Uh, it, was, it was more about representation. And there's a perception, at least um, in conversation 
with uh, the Army, we just had a diversity and inclusion strategic offsite to write our policy. Mm -hmm. And some of the conversation that came up uh, with some of the stakeholders in the room, uh, i.e. the Army Research Institute, the Center for Army Professional Ethics, uh, and a couple of other external stakeholders from who work with me uh, directly in the Pentagon talked about, we have to get away from representation where we're saying, hey, I want to sit at the table, and then you just throw a representation of what you want there at the table, right. but it doesn't necessarily um, satisfy what we really want to do. Right. Okay. And that sounds more like setting quotas, which we do not do in the federal government as far as ethnic groups. You would want someone that have the knowledge, skills, and abilities and not look at the color of their skin or their gender or so forth. So you want to make sure that you have the right qualified person that have those skills. Thank yes. You. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay. Now we all day we're talking about the federal government and the military. We have standards and we have qualifications. But when it comes to putting minorities and women in position, and all of a sudden we're just filling positions because of representation. That is a misnomer. It is false. And we need to stop saying that. Mm -hmm. Because the same qualifications we have in place for white males, for white females, if minorities and women cannot meet those qualifications, then they should not be in the military mm -hmm. or the federal government. Mm -hmm. And then we also say, we're out here recruiting the best and the brightest. Are we really, or are we just recruiting, like you, somebody was saying, our uncles, our aunts, our friends, or whoever, mm -hmm. okay? So how do we measure that? If we really want to get to the crux of, and, uh, of this representation issue, say for example, I'm with the National Guard Bureau, the state of Vermont looks very different than the state of Georgia. It looks very different than the state of Alaska, so on and so forth. So what's representative of Vermont does not represent the country in total. What's representative of Georgia does not represent the country in total. So we have to be careful when we start talking about representation. Mm -hmm. Real representation represents the competencies and the skill sets that are required to fill a position. And that is what we need to be looking for. Absolutely. If I want sure, I want people that look like me because I want my granddaughter to be able to look up and say, oh, look, it's possible for me to get there. Right. Sure, okay, that's the reality of it. That's why representation is important. Mm -hmm. But we must stop spreading this, <clears throat> this room, excuse me, that we are lowering standards. No to and get quality people in the federal government. And that, I cannot abide it, I can't stand it, it hurts my ears when I hear it. Right, no one should be lowering their standards, and that's why I think OPM, when they started revamped USA Jobs, at one time years ago, there used to actually be people who would rank your application. Now USA Jobs, it's computerized, so they're not looking at you, they're not looking at a name, they're not looking at where you're from, it's, looking at the computer is pulling out name, uh, pulling out specific skills. And again, you're right, you have to be a qualified individual to uh, perform the essential duties of your job. So it shouldn't be about how many people you need in this position or if you're, you know, you need a certain amount of women in one position. It's about being qualified for the position and knowing the skills and abilities. Absolutely. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mark Matoya, retired Coast Guard. Yay, Coast Guard. Yes. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see a lot of Coast Guard in the room. <laughs> I just one, just two of us, right? I, the, uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to kind of stay on this same line here uh, because I also hear folks talk about uh, I'm blocked to get the people I want to get. Mm. when I, you know, they, they're not making the search mm -hmm. or the people I want, the veterans are getting in the way or the minorities are getting in the way, right? So you must have a strategy uh, where you help folks in the IRS understand mm -hmm. that they have to do some things earlier in the game plan. If we're waiting till we're sitting and the, and the panel is making the decision, that's a little bit too late mm -hmm. to fill these qualified 
uh, people. So, so what are what's some of the suggestions you have given IRS around mm -hmm. hiring, having that talented pool available? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That, that stuff. And one of the good things that uh, I see within the IRS, they do a lot of promoting within. So they'll offer job opportunities to people within the IRS first. That's number one. And we have a lot of mentoring programs where they can go and ask for mock interviews. They have various employee organizations. We're one of the few organizations that have 22 recognized employee organizations. We even have an employee organization called Military of Outreach of Service, and it's our MOSS organization. So all these different organizations offer different type of mentoring programs. They do mock interviewing. And when there's jobs that are available that people feel like they want to apply for and try to compete against, they'll call the organizations and say, hey, could you possibly uh, conduct a mock interview for me for this one position that I'm looking for? So everyone actually have an opportunity. And when I say that there's an organization in the IRS for everyone, I mean that there's one for everyone. We even uh, started recently the Next Gen organization for the millennials that are coming into the workforce. Any other questions? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a 15-minute break. <laughs>